morning, everyone. Richard Miller, you're at Never Not Here. Don't touch that dial. <laughs> so thanks for coming. And uh, we're having a lot of opportunity to speak with a lot of people from a lot of parts of the world and also people that have traveled a lot and have taken personal experiences all around the world. And, uh, so we find it very uplifting and very expansive that uh, we can know through other people's experience and we can talk to them and feel what they say and I suppose we're evaluating it and trying to understand if it's meaningful for our life but uh, this is the chance we have this is how we as humans how we interact and uh, I find it so enjoyable I know you do too because you're here <laughs> So anyhow, this morning we're speaking with Laura Sims. So welcome, Laura. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm talking to you from New York. So you may hear the garbage truck passing by and traffic and so forth. <laughs> We've done a few recordings in New York, and we do get the music of the streets. And every once in a while, <laughs> the police have to get somewhere fast, and <laughs> it echoes through there. And the windows seem to let it in, and uh, we like it. <laughs> Hmm. Of course, New York is a big city, and uh, so many different things go on, and so many people have a different take on on what's lo what city life is like. But I wanted to kind of open up and say I've heard, and since you're a world traveler, maybe you can confirm or deny this. But I've heard that the American nation, the American population, the American citizen, is one of the most fearful citizen most motivated by fear in the whole world. Mm. I don't know if you've heard something like that. or. Well, that's very interesting. I, I haven't actually you said that, and my image froze up immediately. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm so the, the, there's fearfulness going but, on there, um, too. I think actually that's interesting because perhaps of many, many, many different cultures, we really are trained from childhood to avoid conflict and um, really confronting the truth of death and things of that sort. So I wonder if that doesn't actually imprint a kind of fear of sudden change and sort of inherent sense of, of fear of things that we don't know about since at the root of our lives is always the haunting fact which can be add to the beauty of our lives or, or sorrow of our lives is the fact of death so i wonder if it isn't true that we have a lot of fear we're always trying to figure out who we are and make understanding and control over our lives and we're very materialistic culture so that is a, a world filled with fear you know, in one way, fear is about tomorrow because, you know, in all the trials and travails of life has had passed and we're in the past, then we would rejoice. We would be happy. <laughs> but, hmm. uh, but I guess we think that, no, gee, those bad things could happen again. And so m most of fear is about tomorrow. I would say all of it myself, but I don't have to assert that. And... Uh, so we could say fear is an abstraction, and so maybe we're the most abstracted nation. Hmm. I don't know. It makes me think, actually, about the idea of expectation and the American dream. I can remember at some point in my life really strongly believing that with each year everything does get better and you keep climbing up a ladder towards success, actually even... Um, freedom from the pain of the dentist. I can remember sitting in the dentist chair as a little girl and thinking, well, when I get to be an adult, I'm not going to feel pain here in the dentist chair. But the, the quality of expectation and, and hope that you can always have what you want and also the emphasis on individualism does make for a lot of abstraction because it's about assuming what should be rather than being in direct contact with what is and maybe that's the abstraction that direct contact then you're always there with whatever happens absolutely absolutely and and maybe accepting whatever happens 
is somehow the miracle of life, and somehow denying whatever happens is, well, it, it's a basis of fear for one thing that we're talking about. I just define my life by travels and this interest that I have in all that you're beautifully bringing up, which is that I'm a storyteller, and I study mythic perspective and how through the use of narrative in many ways we're able to unfix from um, disturbing abstract uh, negative fixed stories about ourselves and open ourselves up more fully to being in the world as it is with great compassion and communication and i love the cultures of the world the mythologies of more traditional peoples that have in their stories templates for wisdom and sort of pathways into how to uncover some inherent joy and definitely connection to the natural world and each other and invisible things. So that's a little capsule of what I do that makes this conversation for me very visceral and poignant. Actually, it's amazing, and you know, it's a, it's always been amazing to us here at Never Not Here because we we really talk about this a lot and we study it a lot. That so many times a story is an abstraction that takes us away from our life, a story that we tell about ourselves of how it should be, and and what we should protect and how we should live mm. and who we should allow into our sphere, mm. and uh, and then at the same time another story can actually be freedom from that first story. Mm. And that's the amazing part, you know, that somehow the use of the story is not even necessarily to make a, the right story, but just to show that the one that we're dwelling on is, is not all that important, maybe. And maybe it's the cause of us being in a cul-de-sac or blind alley or, you know, or feeling pressure in our life. You know, the great stories of the world are usually journeys that begin with someone or other being in that cul-de-sac. And the story is a template or an experiential, lived, imaginative drama through which you actually can confront that cul-de-sac and uh, through different characters, the consequences of being in it. And then from there, you're actually my screen just went black. <laughs> okay, now I'm frozen again. But um, the journey allows us to actually also go with the hero or heroine who becomes that part of ourselves through that cul-de-sac with alternatives and actually move beyond it in some way that is more enlivening, more access to wisdom, more access to inherent life force, and in that way becomes part of the world and is engaged in a kind of repair. So, and with personal stories, I've always thought too that I, I think of the stories that actually capture us in negativity or in what you're calling a cul-de-sac, which is a beautiful expression for this, and actually is often really experienced like that, a personal story can either further encapsulate us, capture us in that state, or it can become a liberation. In fact, the same story could do that, depending on who's telling it and how it's being told. A story that doesn't engage, that's just a kind of surface, rousing up gossip and negativity, I don't think of as a story. I think of that as a kind of manipulative um, anecdote. A story is something that engages and in the very process of it opens the, the mind and connects with the heart. And it is always about transformation and pliability of mind. Does that make any sense? You know, I've sa I started saying, too uh, much? no, no, it's fabulous. I started saying <laughs> pretty, pretty regularly these days just to see how it sounds to myself and to others that uh, what we react to in our life is the story we tell. 
And the story exactly. we tell, of course, means the interpretation of, of, of the events that we actually, the events maybe are an interpretation already because we're seeing things, but we're somehow looking through the filter of our belief systems. <clears throat> well, that's yeah. actually one of my great um, passions to work with. I think that we do often not even know the real stories that rule our lives. Sometimes the story that we tell is the exact opposite of that and has to do with wanting to get rid of that story. So there has to be some very um, compassionate way of acknowledging and uncovering the stories. It's like an onion until we get to the stories that actually we do believe. They're like um, fish and water stories. We hardly recognize them. And when we see them, then there's enough distance to actually begin to do something different and to reshape that story, even honoring how important it was at some point or that we had no choice but to take this story in. So I'm very interested, of course, in the compassionate aspect of undoing these stories so that we don't become more and more aggressive towards ourselves. There's right. I mean, I, I understand exactly where you're coming from when you say fish and water story. It just means it's unconscious <laughs> or you're saying like, okay, the fish says this is life. This is how it is, you know, and we're saying this is how life works. And, and we, exactly. we don't yeah. think it's a story. But what I'm saying is and, and what I'm discovering and what we are mm -hmm. discovering here is that we react to a story. You know, all our reactions are not to any reality. I mean, we don't really have to assert uh, uh, that uh, that really we know nothing of what's happening. We don't have to make an assertion like that. We can just say that the story is so important that let's focus on the story. In other words, uh, you can't really know what's happening without an interpretation. I mean, well, actually, I don't think I... it hits the radar. Well, I think the radar is the conceptual mind that always wants to understand and make an immediate um, logical narrative or associations with what's going on. But there's another part of our mind that can access being in the story moment by moment. And then the story that comes from that place, like the roots drawing up water beneath the earth, to grow the tree, that story that accesses that place in the mind that's untarnished by our endless neurotic story-making um, fiesta is, uh, allows us to actually both be in the world with what is actually occurring, which is very energetic and tender, and also to acknowledge when the stories are are going on and say, wow, I am doing that, which is a, a kind of liberation. I don't think we ever get away from this part of our mind that is going to make up a story about something. Uh, but what I'm Well, it's always going, you know, it's always going, but it's, uh, <laughs> it, you know, we don't have to necessarily follow it. We don't have to always get so curious about, oh my gosh, where's my story going now? And, and you know, this is going to be important for me. I better have, I better know that. I think you said something that really struck a chord with me is when you said being in the story moment to moment, which is different than trying to fix the story, right? I mean, exactly what did you mean by that or how does that work? Mm -hmm. Well, the other uh, part of my life that is almost as um, long lived as my being a storyteller is my um, practice and study of Tibetan Buddhist meditation. So at some point, I was a student of Joseph Campbell and completely in love with mythology and stories. And Joe said something to me. I was very young. So did you go to Sarah Lawrence? No, no. I was at his first workshop when he left Sarah Lawrence and retired. <laughs> right across the street from where I live now. Wow. <laughs> at a great painter, Paul Jenkins, loft. A loft like the one that you can almost see behind me. But um, Joe said to me, oh, you're a storyteller. And this gathering of people. I was there quite by accident, brought by a wonderful musician. But uh, everybody, the P.L. Travers was there. There were anthropologists there and famous psychiatrists and so forth. And he said, and what do you do? And I said, well, I'm thinking of becoming a storyteller. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, he said, Laura, then you'll spend your life discovering that all this world is a story. So that set me off on the track 
of what is that? And that's been a deepening experience for me. <laughs> so it was later, actually, a couple of years later, um, that I attended a talk by the great Tibetan Buddhist meditation teacher, Chögyam Trungpa Rinpoche. And I then um, went to... And what inspired me, actually, was all of the reading I was doing on Inuit stories and African uh, mythology. And I was working at the Brooklyn Museum and the Natural History Museum doing projects. And in this wild uh, actual um, delving into missionary journals and the secret archives of the Natural History Museum in New York. But I then realized that the really great storytellers understood something about the nature of mind and they had access to something. And it was always being described as this amazing, uncompromising, unrelenting journey. And when I met a meditation teacher, I had this sense that, well, I couldn't go out in the tundra and find a teacher now, but he seemed to be making the invitation to actually meet my mind. <laughs> so I began going on retreat and going to classes and meditating and slowly applying that to this of what I began to understand process of reciprocal engagement that really is a story. It's not about what's written on the page. It's not about the text analyzing. There was something in how our mind is kept alive through direct communication that began to fascinate me, that led me to where I am. It was just a little detour, but it is still ongoing 42 years later. <laughs> Say more about what you meant by <laughs> reciprocal engagement. Reciprocal engagement. Does that mean relationships between humans, or is that just with your own mind and your own perceptions? Or where, what is that engagement? Well, it is It is relationship um, with other people. I mean, we, you, you don't... I mean, we do tell stories to ourselves all the time. I mean, anyone who is listening in their mind will, is shocked always at the level of it. But this is about being drawn out of self-consciousness into the ongoing spoken story that actually does many things on many levels for the listener. And for me, that's story. That's engaged story. And it's reciprocal. There's a level of intellectual, conceptual listening. We all know about that. That's where we try to understand it. But the moment-by-moment -moment quality of storytelling where you have this kind of like um, gossamer and changing film going on in your mind, your imagination, which is very intuitive, is responding. So you're making images. You're feeling moment-by-moment. The storyteller, when they're really alert, is responding to that as you are responding to them. There's something very alive in this engagement, and that's what I really love. Let's, that's what I let's try to really look into that deeply for our listeners and for me too. I mean, but okay. that, because right. we said, you know, yeah, this is it. You know, like we first we said that we we're engaged in storytelling all the time, and we're, and we're in actual reciprocal storytelling, and so then. What strikes me is uh, when we come from a fixed point and we're trying, mostly filtering all the stories we hear and trying to find out who agrees with us and trying to verify our own story. And so then we're really not into that, what you're talking about, this gossamer uh, flow of uh, pull and take, give and take. And so there's then no how, can we, how, can we, how no can we somehow uh, <laughs> let go of our expectations or somehow just... Mm, what do they say in movies that you have to kind of somehow let go of your objections and and go with the story? Somehow is that? Um, you know, it, it is. It, I think two things. One is that that's the trick of the storyteller. The trick of the storyteller is that the story is so interesting that you want to know what's going to happen next, so that you do go, and that process of going actually opens up the deeper listening. Because in order to imagine your mind and body are synchronized, it's why, like, I can go into a high school and there's 500 young people and they're totally chaotic. They're on their texting. It's, you know, it's like complete <laughs> um, distraction land. 
And then the story starts, and at some point, their mind and body is focused, and everyone's right there, and they are listening, seemingly listening to the content, but something's happening inside as well. And there is delight, there's sorrow, there's, there's a lot of sudden open space in the room that occurs. So then let's just take it where you went next. I think you said, okay, so a lo- uh, imaging, some great imaging is happening. And they're absorbing this story and these images are coming up. And then there's this cross of these images. What is this? What, how is that happening? I think the natural um, activity of the mind um, in the sort of outer level is to create thoughts and make narrative meaning. But the vastness of the mind has a, produces image almost before language. So if I'm describing the tall, thin, green leaves that I see in your room, suddenly your mind may not see the same ones, but from a kind of non-conceptual place, sort of like inside itself, an image arises. It's like the house of dreams wide awake. And that is very satisfying to us human beings. It actually can remove us from the stress of preoccupation or the loop of fixation. I used to go into hospitals all the time and engage people in telling stories to help them relax. Um, And it was an amazing experience for me to see the fraught, terrified um, uh, person suddenly relax enough that maybe the inherent qualities of healing in their own body or at least space could come up so they could hear what the doctor was actually saying or communicate what their needs are as opposed to being endlessly caught in a fear or a loop of something. Do you follow what I'm saying? The imaging factory of our dream mind, which is has to do a lot with immediacy, is um, is not only natural, but it's It's refreshing. It's replete with space, and it allows us to have some pliability of thinking. So in working in peacemaking and tolerance, my aim is not so much to come up with strategies, solutions, or fixing something, but to open that place and then let people be together from that place so they can actually just hear each other. It's about listening. Usually we're um, somehow hardly hearing what the other person says because we're trying to interpret it whether we agree with it or not as you said or projecting onto that person we think they're saying so the newness could produce some kind of panic or um, space out but if the mind is more pliable you might suddenly hear somebody say I didn't criticize you I actually said such and such and you might say Oh, is that what you were saying? I'm so sorry. I assumed you said this. This is the cause of wars. <laughs> All right, for sure. No, if I'm getting I'm, it, you I, know, like I, I'm getting this skill that where you're talking about, if I'm understanding it, somehow the images are so interesting, but so, so full of color and perfume and uh, and woven in such a beautiful and fine texture that maybe there's not enough time for a lot of concepts to come up with them and it's just somehow there's just the joy of the play of these images and it doesn't really seem like yeah it doesn't really seem like that and so then you kind of build this uh this soft space with these images where people what should i call it they're you know they're Readiness, to, readiness to fight or something <laughs> is kind of softened, you know. Their their aggressiveness, their aggressive tone is kind of softened, and somehow, and their their protective tone, like they feel like I'm I'm here that I'm going to get attacked, you know. Okay, it could even be in a in a in a political negotiation, international mm, arena, you know, where people need to mm, soften and start to uh, be open so that listening can happen. And uh, yes, yeah. and you're and then. It could also be in a business meeting where you're, you're, you know, businesses are talking about sustainability or 
what is it that we could do to um, protect the environment, protect our workers, protect our customers, you know, somehow embrace or include more of the world than we have been including, or is that possible? And somehow there's a softening that has to go on because otherwise somebody says, no, we're not going to spend anything on this stuff. It doesn't go to the bottom line or, you know, they've got a fixed position and they, they can't even hear any other arguments. And, uh, yeah. And of course you can't say to somebody that's wrong. There's a great story actually, um, that a very elderly man who was the secretary at UNESCO told me some years ago on my way to Israel to the first, last, and only Jewish Arab storytelling festival that occurred. And I ended up opening up this festival with this story because there had been a, a bomb that day and the Arabic storytellers said they didn't want to go first and the Israeli storytellers didn't want to go first. And I said, hey, you know, I'm from New York. I grew up Jewish. I study Buddhism and I love Arabic stories. I'll go first. <laughs> so I told this story about um, that uh, Monsieur Sviadak had told me about Nasruddin. In, um, cu in countries like Turkey and North Africa, the, he's a character, like a trickster character, but a, a wisdom character. And it's not like he always has wisdom, but it's the story itself that um, like sort of surprises your mind into seeing something you didn't see, sometimes it, with hilari hilarity. But he told me this story about when Nasruddin was asked to be a judge in a village that had three families that were feuding for generations. And basically they were killing each other for years and years, I mean generations. So he was to listen to their story and decide which one was right. So the great patriarchs of the family all stood up, and the first one said, you know, this happened, that happened, this happened, that happened, then that happened, I'm right. Next one said, oh, you know, he and his whole family were sleeping for a hundred years because it did not happen that way, that's not it. It happened this way, then that way, I'm right. Then the third person got up and said, you know, maybe the second family was sleeping, but uh, also stupid because it's completely wrong. It didn't happen like that. And this is what happened and why I'm so angry and I am right. So they asked Nasruddin about his decision. He said, I don't know what the problem is if you're all right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine sitting in the situation where people have been fighting and you tell them it's absurd, but much more true story. And that laughter breaks open this space. Somebody says, oh, but that doesn't matter. I'm still right. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> but it, that's part, part of it. How, how do we, um, first of all, I guess we have to sort of, peek in, spy in, and ransack our own attachment to belief systems and like um, secret armies of inner aggression that separate us, not only from each other, but you're talking about the environmental movement. I mean, what is our common ground with people who we're fighting with um, over these issues? And so for me, the sort of invisible fact here is that the common ground might not be agreed upon issues, but the common ground might be our wanting to make meaning or our both having a story that we really both believe is true. And in that we have something very powerful in common. So if you can bring it to some realization of that, then you can begin to have some talking points and listening to each other. This is not a, a quick fix it process. Although there are immediate results, at least of warmth, when you melt, you can be loving to other people. You talk about uh, confronting the armies of aggression within and somehow looking at your own stories, your own continuous story and so on. And I'm not so sure if that's actually your work or if that's how you, how you've in the, in the final windup placed yourself has given yourself this ability to actually, uh, these insights because you've faced your own. Uh, uh, I don't think, I think that's quite a challenge to ask people to, uh, fit, you know, look for these fish and water things, you know, that they don't really see and that, that it's not 
it could be a lifetime of work in a way to, I'm not even suggesting that needs to be either, but uh, it's, not necess- it's not necessarily something that happens in one session or one, uh, you know, one. Yeah. Yeah. But sometimes you have a small revelation, even, you know, first of all, I'll answer the first question, which is, I'm, that's in some ways part of my work as a storyteller, because if I can understand it in myself, it's visceral, and I can have a lot of empathy for other people and understand how difficult it is or how time-consuming it is to do that. And um, so I try to create activities um, for people. A lot of time what I'm doing with people is helping them to story fully or reframe the story, get to the essence of their story or or find a story that can release them from tremendous pain in some way. So I have to come up with activities that are not like, um, you know, going after someone, but allowing it to happen naturally from within them. Their insight is more important than my insight about it. My insight has to be about my own life and having confidence that I'm willing to listen and just be a guide as best I can. Um, I forgot the second question, which I thought was really a wonderful one, but you might have to, so that's, yes, I, if I don't do that myself, how can I ask somebody else to do it? Well, I'm just wondering if you can, if you can actually, in the format that you're working, can actually ask people, I mean, you can't ask people, okay, um, study Buddhism, for instance, and start to confront your own your own mind. That's not exactly what you're doing, you know. But you're giving hints. A lot of the stories I tell are are my own experiences. Right. For one, and two, um, you know, Buddhism is just a word, and if it has any truth, like any good spiritual path, it's really about something that's available to all of us. So, in my work, my interest is in creating activities where people actually experience their presence, even for a moment. And now I remember what you said. Oh. Um, it does take, it can be a long time, and that's a person's personal journey or even their personal choice. But there are always, like, surprises and revelations. You know, you do a workshop, and I'm sure you've had that experience, where all of a sudden, or even a conversation with somebody, you see something from another perspective. Or it's as if a little window opened up, fresh air blew in, and all of a sudden you are released from something that has been even imagine living without it as if some kind of concrete hat was attached to your head and you said well I can't get this off and suddenly so those moments where there is possibility are very inspiring because the we're all capable of and have the capacity for immense um, communication and what you call the melt <laughs> So, so my work is in some ways to just create some kind of experience of possibility. And then if I get to work, you know, in a situation for a long time, or that I may be working with people actually taking them through their story. But it's both a kind of immediate activity, and then there's the potential for long term change. And I work in a lot of different situations. Is that answering? Well, that's, no, that's answering touching? really well. But I'd, I'd like to go back and, and understand that a little bit better. Do you, do you have uh, chances to repetitively see the same people, uh, like do a series or do uh, some kind of like a workshop that lasts, um, you know, three meetings or something like that? Well, first of all, every year I have conducted one or two week residencies where up to 14 people work with me for seven to 10 days and they work on a single story. And even though I have them work on the traditional story, a lot of the work is personal story, but I'm not a therapist and I don't want to invade people. So I work with their stories in and out of the images provoked by the traditional story. And I help them to choose stories that have a journey that can contain and and help them so that If you are confronting something, um, I'll begin with something before that and then take people something beyond it. 
Then when I worked, I worked on a project with Roma gypsy mothers in Romania for a year. I, I went back and forth about 12 times and I worked with the same group of women. I had a chance to keep developing what I was doing and helping them to become more aware of the stories that they believed and, and how they were communicating. Ultimately, in the beginning, it was about their being better storytellers for their children. Then it was about their feeling better about themselves. Ultimately, it was about how you give voice and how you listen so that in situations where they had to make their needs may, meant, um, their needs exposed and heard, that they weren't aggressively turning off the very people that they were asking something of and that they could find some more um, contentment within themselves and not only accept like the fish and water thing of generations of seeing themselves as victims or as thieves or as lesser people. And they, they were remarkably wonderful. So they're those. And then sometimes somebody will send someone or someone will come to me and I'll work with them from anywhere from a month to five, six years with stories being the source of, of helping them. And sometimes I see someone once or I work in a school or I go into um, a corporation that's having conflicts and I get people to do counsel and tell stories. And I never, at the end of one of these meetings, and I'm not permitted to say where it was, at the very end, the head CEO said to me, how could you have understood all that we were talking about? And I made the mistake of saying, I didn't understand a single word about your business. That's not what I was listening to. And then the whole room froze up. <laughs> it's like, I should never have said it. But it, I wasn't listening to that. I couldn't understand that part, literally. But I could understand the images and their vulnerability and create activities where they could talk to each other and relax when there was tremendous stress in that office and begin to talk to each other in a new way or just even enjoy themselves in each other which makes a big difference. <laughs> I, tell us more about activities, because you say activities. That's really intri intriguing. <laughs> I mean, really, do you just set up uh, role-playing and things like that? Or what, is, what goes Sometimes, on? Sometimes. Uh, I did set up role-playing um, in a harassment, in a situation with sexual harassment at airlines. But um, in this situation, for instance, what I really felt was that in this corporation, generations of people had depended on the corporation like kind of birth through death you know beyond the grave where you're really taken care of and a lot of that was changing and of course people were feeling um frightened and disoriented because they could now get fired or there wasn't a sureness that they would have their jobs for the rest of their lives and i think a lot of people have felt this and a lot of people are feeling the Confusion is said the fear of suddenly losing your job, losing your identity, losing your capacity to take care of yourself and your family. So at some point, what I felt was really needed was a ritual, like a funeral. But I could never do that in that context. So outside of the context of our meetings, which went from 8.30 in the morning until 5 o'clock, and I was not alone, I was with two other people working, I said, why don't we have a storytelling tonight? And I would love to tell you a story about my father. And then maybe you can tell me stories about your childhood. So in that situation, I told an amazing story about my father, but I told the whole story of my father's death. And so in a way, although I couldn't talk about it, about what was happening to them, they could live out through my story a lot of feelings about loss, grief, um, Love, fear, they could live out the feelings, maybe not the content, which I couldn't address in that situation. It wasn't really permissible or helpful. And then afterwards, I got them to each tell stories about something they had when they were children. There were like 29 men and one woman, something they lost as a child, and tell the story. So someone told about a bike, someone told about their dog, and they shared these. They had never known these things about each other, but they could express loss, in, even though it was personal, but it was indirect from the situation they were in. And in that way, by feeling it, that melting occurred. 
So the next day, we went back to the table and we could talk about the situation between management and um, you know, regular workers and higher authorities, so forth. The conversation could be, they could listen to each other and have um, a, a tender connection. They had lived through each other's story. That's the trick. If I tell no, you No, no, I totally father, get it. I totally get, get it. it. Get it? Because okay, you, you, you got them to experience the feelings, to starting with the feelings of your exactly. father's loss or the, your loss of your father yes. or your father's loss. Then they started to experience the feelings of losing their bike, losing their dog and stuff and just saying, okay, these feelings can come up now, you know. Like, and so then that was the big block of the, of the, two, of the, uh, yeah, the log like jam, you know. The log jam of the company was that nobody's yes, going to let that yeah. feeling come up, you know. And, they're and gonna you just, can't. Yeah. I asked, what happens if you cry or if you express yourself? And, and you lose. Said to me, <laughs> so I said, you get, you're fired. You're, you're out of there. It's not part of the culture. But I want to bring it back to what you were asking about before, which was so beautiful about images. Right. Because you're hearing me tell the story about my father's death. And so it seems like what you're imagining is me and my father, but what you imagine really comes out of your own psyche and your own experience. So it calls forth your image. You don't have an idea of what my father looks like. So everybody is filling in those feelings with their own imagination. And in that allows them to touch something without it being invasive or harmful. Follow what I'm saying? That's Absolutely. Really no, no. I see that. I think that's a miracle. I think you're a genius. <laughs> I think that is fabulous. You know? know. No, it's a it's wonderful way to slip it in there, you know. It's just totally, really fabulous. <laughs> because my ex-husband just, just, yeah? Tell me. My ex-husband used to call me the story spy. Oh, yeah? Or the story doctor. The story doctor. Depends no, what on I want to say is that, like, we're talking about, uh, you know, in the beginning of the conversation, we talked about... Uh, what's happening in this moment, you know, uh, yeah. with, with or without a story, you know, there's a story and we're reacting to the story of this moment and some of it we don't want. And what we don't want is those feelings. And so th that's what's uh, blocking our life in, uh, in all sectors, really. And you kind of just uh, do, do you applied oil to that and, uh, and loosened those <laughs> feelings. And but said, do you think we don't want it? because we think that it's going to overwhelm us or it's going to humiliate us in some way? Because once you actually realize that you can contain it and you can actually work with it, that you don't even have to expose it to anybody else, then it, it's like a monster. You think that monster is really going to devour you. But then I have people invent their own monsters and describe them. <laughs> and then by it's, – it's like um, – you know, it seems so ordinary to me to, to work like this. Um, but do you think that's it? I mean, do you think that that's what Well, people... you know, people, I don't know what it is. It's just like uh, if you feel bad and if there's these overwhelming feelings, uh, they're really not, there's no reins on them. You know, you're really, it's not, a, uh, it's not a team of horses that you're driving around. It's a, you know, you're being swept away in some kind of a exactly. current, right? And then... So it feels like, well, this is failure. This is uh, the, the worst thing that I, I would never want this mm -hmm. to happen, you know. And so I'm just going to plug it up. And then, you know, and anyhow, for some reason, it's kind of automatic that the, the best way to escape it is to go into an abstraction, which means like, oh, I'll explain what's happening, number one. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll think of how to fix it, number two. Oh, I'll make a strategy for tomorrow, number three, you know. And those are all ways to get away from that feeling and to be away from it and then never feel it again, you know. And so then you can just go to something like, hmm. he's wrong, he's wrong, I'm right, he's wrong, you know, and the, whatever is coming, those feelings are coming up. Or right? I'm wrong and I'm stupid and I've always oh, been yeah. stupid. Oh, yeah, I never so get I'm it right and I'm uh, just inadequate from time one and, you know, either way is the same, really. But they're, uh, both of them had the same uh, success rate as far as getting you away from the feeling, you know, they're both abstractions and... And so you're either kicking someone else or kicking yourself. You know, it's uh... that's that's it. Really, I I like what you're saying. I mean, it gives it a good, understandable um, map of what it happens, and it does happen so immediately that it takes either someone who's outside, deeply listening, or someone who's can actually 
somehow bring you to a place where you actually slow down enough that there is that little gap between the instinct to leap onto that storyline, habitual storyline, or can actually, woo, I was just about to say that you were wrong, <laughs> woo, and then be see how much um, propulsion is behind engineering that, and it's that energy that then I like to um, work with in another series of exercises, which I think you'll like. <laughs> And I just did this in Haiti. I'm, I'm training teachers in Haiti, educators. So some of them are teachers and some are just people who created classrooms and camps. And it's a wonderful project sponsored by Mercy Corps. And I did an exercise with them that I developed once in a junior high where I did not know what to do to help these kids just for a moment experience control over their own bodies in a way that had that wasn't just dancing or working with the drum or singing, but was actually their feeling into it. Because I might start with a lot of call and response in music, because that allows us to do that. But I wanted them to just feel it. And so I began this crazy exercise experiment of saying, okay, this can be really hard now. And I don't think any of you are really going to be able to do this. But you're going to stand up. I'm going to count to 20. And like moving the whole time, never stopping. I want you to be on the ground, lying down when I get to 20. So then I would have them count and I would do it. So and it was like a slow try. motion, like they had to be in slow motion? Yeah, slow motion, but always moving. So suddenly you start to gain control over the fluidity of your body and you're in your body. And then I would do it like 35 to stand up. Okay five to get down, <laughs> but never being jerky, jerky movements. And so after a while, then they watch each other and it's very beautiful. But by the end of it, there was this sense of deep presence and accomplishment. But I never explained what I was doing. That would be beside the point. We would flip back up into our heads. So we just did that. And then we would go on to the next activity. <laughs> so I was trying to use what, you know, in the field is called icebreakers which is interesting for the melting point of view. As teachers, to give them things to do, but also for themselves. When I was there was when the election, fraudulent elections were being announced and there was a fear of violence, which did break out. I wanted to help people just before they left that day to really come back to themselves. So as a closure for the day, so I started the counting exercises and it was so gorgeous. And people, of course, are laughing. And it takes a kind of inner focus so that um, it was very beautiful. After that, we had lovely conversation and people made their blessings to end the day. It's a very religious and wonderful culture. But I felt that doing that over a period of time really helps people. I would, I would do this with business people. I did it at Fordham University when I once assisted someone in a business management course. What was the storyteller doing there? And, uh, hey, man, she's in our face. And uh, <laughs> so that's, that's a kind of more subversive activity. I love it. That's great. You got to <laughs> do everything you can, you know. <laughs> Let me say, let me, let me ch ch shift gears just a little bit and see where we go on this one, you know, like, uh, so we talked about abstraction and we talked about uh, uh, memory, I guess. I don't know if we did or not, but we, we no, did talk, we didn't talk about memory. Well, That's memory, I mean, okay, memory is images, right? So then the story is, is images. But memory the, is images of things, of, of how you recall what you think happened. Well, yeah, it's images of our story in a way because uh, it's so interlaced with uh, the interpretation part that uh, it's kind of, kind of images of the story. So, But, I mean, memory, uh, the only way to get to the past is by a memory or a thought about, or, you know, uh, what you what should we say like uh, an imagination? You can imagine how it was, you know. You can take some mm -hmm. evidence, and you know, like mm. archaeologists will find a tool and they'll say, "Well, maybe they lived like this because they had this kind of a. This looks like a tool." And so then there's an imagination there too to go to the past, but but everything in the in the in the in the past 
of course, is uh, has no life, and there's no way to get there, and it and it doesn't even really exist anywhere in the world. I mean, uh, maybe Buddhists would say that, you know, but I mean, it it doesn't really take a genius to figure it out. That uh, the only way you can do anything is here. In the past, is in a way, I guess you'd call it just plain dead. It's only a memory. It's only a series of thoughts. Where's the past? I don't know if it's dead. Where, I think it's it's um, not in the present. Where does it show up? You know, in the world as existentially. Where does it exist? It exists only in a human thought pattern. Not even an animal has those thought patterns. Not even uh, the rocks. The rocks. But there is cause and effect. I mean, the reason why you're sitting here doing this or asking one question is because the question before that was asked. So there's some relationship to how things arise. They may arise moment by moment due to circumstances coming together. But the design of this room that I'm in has everything to do with the things that I brought into it and also a period of time of architecture, what existed you know, before the building. Um, there is some clues and, and like almost psychic footprints perhaps of those things. So it's not completely, you know, there is the actuality is the present, but then how we construct the world has a lot to do. I'm not an expert in this, I'm not a genius at this at all, but I'm a thinking with you. So that's why I said the past is not dead. There's something about, there's something. Con- well, evidence of the past is alive. That though, that evidence of the past that's here in the in the present. It's in yeah, the present, that's, though. Uh, that's the yeah, alive that's, part. That mm-hmm. the actual memory of when I when I put this uh, this piece when I collected this piece and put it on that table. That's dead, but the piece is still on the table, and you know, it, the, whatever feeling. You know, well, actually, feelings are are also part of thoughts. <laughs> feelings are I mean, because you think of something and and you can feel a certain way, and then you think of something else and you feel a different way. That's how the movies work. They take images and give you thoughts. But the, that, that, yeah, but the movie is definitely not reciprocal. The movie is um, is someone else's projected story, and the way that we watch it is very different. Well, I'm, uh, you know, just to make it easy, I'm saying that uh, what really happens and uh, how life can change is, is, it, is in this moment. And the past, in that sense, is dead because you can't go back to last Thursday and fix anything. You can fix it now, and if it's fixable still, but maybe that, maybe that moment is not and is never repeatable. You know, who knows? And uh, what I'm just saying is that. Uh, all of you know, it doesn't take any kind of spiritual genius or anything like that to understand that this is the PowerPoint. This is the moment that everything happens, and does nothing happens tomorrow because tomorrow is always tomorrow, and nothing happens yesterday because yesterday is a goner. <laughs> mm. And uh, so then I was just wondering because I was even talking with some people yesterday, and they were saying, "Well, oh, just from even from for so long, you know." It's just been etched into me. These certain things from childhood are etched into me, and I just can't let go of them. You know, there's no way that people can change that much. And uh, I'm saying, isn't that strange that this is, that's the dead part of life, really, and it has more power than the live part of life. Like, now is when we can change anything, but we're saying that we can't change ourselves because we're fixed from before. And how could that be, you know? Well, I guess you it's just what you said before. It's a story. And it's a story that is believed. And for most of us, if we believe it, we think it's true. And it's very shocking when something happens that undermines the um, reality of that truth. In a sense, a lot of the people I work with, for instance, I work with a young man who had both arms cut and the war, Sierra Leone, when he was 12 years old. And so whatever he believed about the world is was changed. A, a lot of that was changed at that moment because what was inconceivable actually happened and he lived through it. Same thing in some ways for the people I'm working with in Haiti. 
there you are. You don't ever conceive, except maybe in a movie or a nightmare, that the walls of your house are just going to crumble to dust. And when you crawl out thinking you're the only one, you suddenly see that a whole city has fallen like a cardboard stack of cards or a, 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 a cake that fell over. I mean, that's what the capital in Port-au-Prince looks like. It looks like a cake, like a birthday cake that just slumped over. You just never believe that. And that shakes up and opens up the possibility of being in the moment in a different way. And usually that's how we do change because of the shock. Um, so the story, you know, maybe the telling of a story or the revelation of your own story can at least practice seeing things from a different angle. It's not the same shock as that unfiltered reality of crisis. Just to go back what you said, I'll repeat what I think I caught was that uh, the story of uh, those old events somehow is believed as a mm -hmm. is a truth. Yeah. And so because it's believed, hey, no, that was it. That is truth. Then there's a there's a tremendous reluctance to let go of that story, and that story is recreated yeah. in this moment. It's recreated every moment. And, uh, the, it even becomes that it also magnetizes repeated events in our lives. Why did that happen again? Why do I I divorced him and I married the same story? Well, I divorced him and I married the same story. <laughs> I mean, because we magnetize that to ourselves until there's some space in it. So then we're sh even more sure we're, we're it's verified. Yes, that was true because that's how men are. You know, they're always the way that the ones I marry or something like that. You know, you, I mean, so then uh, right. it, it even worse yeah. than yeah, it's just uh, constantly with us. That story that we believe what we believe is true is constantly with us then, and it it shows up in in various forms, and it shows up to verify itself. And uh, that's the reason we don't we 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 re we recreate it in this moment today, and still say, okay, I'm fixed because that was etched into me, my upbringing. You know, I had lost my parents early, or my school was harsh to me, or because um, any uh, any number of stories. You know, and some okay, some in somewhere out in the world where you've traveled to, there's uh, glaring evidence that uh, look, I've been maimed. You know as a child, and uh, then <laughs> that story really sticks with you. Well, that that event, is ir it, there's nothing to do about it. Like the arms are not going to grow back. And that This young man said to me once, my arms will not grow back. If I waste my time constantly being angry or miserable, that's how I'll live. Um, that's so a, that's, an, that's an immense story. That's a wonderful, immense story, immense scene, you know, that it may be even rare. I think it's the same thing Nelson Mandela said when he came out of prison after, I think it was 32 years, and somebody said, aren't you really angry? And he said, "I long ago, I suffered enough to finally give up the unnecessary suffering. And if I spend my whole life being angry, that's all I'll have. In other words, it's kind of so, like it's kind of like those people did that to me, you know, and then they let me go, you know, and that was finished, you know. But I'm still doing it to me because I'm angry about it, and I'm holding, and I, you know, in other words, my aunt was mean to me uh, 30 years ago, and but I've been <laughs> being mean to me myself for those whole right. 30 years, you know, because I just recreate that story and recreate the the negative feelings, the poison, the poisonous closed feelings. Of, uh... yeah, so you know, this is only you know for me. I'm a storyteller, and so and also I'm a meditation teacher. Those are my two um, tools, in a way, other than attempting to just be uh, decently present for anybody <laughs> and myself. But I've always have the question, you know. I become overwhelmed if I think about well, how can I change the whole world? How can I repair everything? And so my commitment has been to whatever I do that underlying it beside, you know, making people happy, listening to stories or offering um, certain activities that underlying it is this opening up. And I know that. So I do the best I can in whatever situations I'm, I'm in, understanding that 
one single person, I'm not talking about myself, but anyone who's listening, um, can have a tremendous effect. And we often think that we're so useless or we do so little. But our simple kind act or anytime we connect has so much effect. It actually changes the alchemy of the big story that we're in. So our little activities of, you know, minor glimpses or sudden um, kindness or the melt, as you beautifully put it, those are really important. And I think that the more and more that occurs, the more and more we might be able to begin to live with each other with more um, curiosity and compassion. You know, we can say that uh, one person can do miracles or, you know, it, de- it depends, you know, on the situation, too. I mean, a Churchill was just a, a, a guy that was a stodgy old guy chomping on cigars, right? But then he was in a situation <laughs> where something of value came through, just came through him, and, uh, and it could have been anyone. You know, maybe the situation is a lot uh, what, uh, what brings out what's necessary in us. But I think it's real easy to see that uh, the big story is just the sum of all the little stories. So if I, as a little story, say, no, I'm not going to do my thing, I'm not going to do it anymore because I can't create these enormous things in the world. And if everybody does that, then the big story is going to be the sum of zero because all the little stories have gone to zero, (laughs) right? I mean, that's a simple enough way to say it without trying to exaggerate anything or make up any kind of like... uh, special, uh, you know, psychic uh, <laughs> occurrences or the but, angels are watching us or something like that. But, uh, but, but Richard, I think the trick is that um, sometimes say, well, I'm never going to do that again. And for about three seconds, there's a commitment to it. And then you walk outside and inadvertently you do it immediately again. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think that... Um, Maybe we have to be a little more um, realistic. At least I feel that way when I'm working with people. Be, you know, it's like I'm. I always say I'm not. I used to say to the Roma women, "Okay, for this hour, you may be relieved of all the burdens of your life, and we can change things in this hour. But when you go back, things are going to be the same." So, um, how? So becoming taking people, so my job in a sense of taking people through the template of these activities, taking them through, sometimes indirectly through, I love very sophisticated fairy tales and mythology and legends, epics, taking people through that indirectly um, allows them to actually uh, psychologically or psychically test out or make the journey internally so that they can begin to have a little click oh, my God, I just did that again, and not punish themselves, which is what we are want to do or give up. But it's like, oh, that's what mind does. It is so attached to doing this habit, it, and they've studied in brain science how you keep deepening the grooves of the brain with the same patterns. It has difficulty just to make a new one. It's altogether possible, but difficult. So how do you come to a place where... People can realize, have enough inner strength to realize or enough experience experience to realize that they could try something very simple and begin to make that change. Because we really are in, I think, a very um, upsetting place in the world. And particularly, you know, I can talk about here in America, you know, looking at the shootings and our, no matter what side we're on, our wanting to be right and vitriolic use of bullying under the you know, heading of politics or fact and, you know, rousing people to violence rather than listening or negotiating or at least not um, carrying, you know, a, a rifle that could kill 100 people out to the supermarket or hidden in your sock in school so that if you don't like somebody's white sneakers, you can get rid of not only the sneakers, but the person, anybody who happens to stand around them. It's so dire at the moment, our incapacity to do what you're saying. Somehow... 
it doesn't seem like telling a dire story can be a very beneficial. Because out of a dire story comes another dire story. Well, a dire story that doesn't have us... Um, sometimes the inside of a story can hold dire sections so that you can actually experience what it's like to be in that dire story. But hopefully the responsibility of us all is to at least take people out of the dire swamp, or as you said, the cul-de-sac at the end of the story so that there is some return rather than feeding the dire swamp story so that you see out of the eyes of the swamp rather than see the swamp from in the sunlight. I think that's a great misuse of stories because the commercial stories, I think, bring us to the swamp and just leave us there. And uh, I agree. I agree with that. And just in its saying, it's being realistic, but it has no responsibility or understanding of how fickle mind is and how many people are disturbed and unable to get out of the swamp and become deeply triggered by by violence that's unmitigated by a, a responsible storyteller or movie maker or TV writer or internet whatever or politician. I think that we forget about how things really affect other people. Yeah, I, I'm just not, I'm not, totally stunned to, totally stunned by the irresponsibility of the like the movie making industry. Totally stunned of how of how how we allow it. And exactly Well, what... we, we fall in love. We become, it's almost like becoming um, allured or addicted to sensation as being alive. So the more and more violence you see, the more you feel like you feel. And so what's sad, of course, is the rich experience of feeling is replaced by this um, need to feel pain and misery and to fix that story of hopelessness. I actually was just writing to someone today about it because a friend said, go see Black Swan, it's great storytelling. So I went and I actually felt sick at the end because I felt that there was no relief. There was no, um, it focused on the suicide and the, unhappiness and the sensation of sex and self-abuse, it didn't give us any um, relief from that. And when I left, I felt almost ill. And my friends were with said, wasn't that great? <laughs> but I felt so <laughs> sick. I felt sick. Then I went to see the next day, this is on my Christmas week with my son, went to see the King's Speech. And I thought, now here's a filmmaker who told a story that allowed us to move through a difficulty to the other side of it with so much humanity that I felt um, moved and empowered as a human being. I mean, a story doesn't have to have a Pollyanna ending. It can have a sad ending, but there is a presence of a storyteller who takes you home, or else there is some inner logic that allows you to feel that but to come back. And no story ends. You know, even if I'm sitting around with people, it doesn't end by my saying, and that's it. That's the end of everything. It's just, and then something else will happen. Or yes, they, Raven died. But then he began to, um, all the birds began to sing. And they lifted his body let and me, took it Let away. me try to make something up here. like Because this is hitting me somewhere, but I don't really have it. So let me see if it'll come out. Because like we were talking about, uh, we were talking about pe <laughs> people uh, saying that I'm uh, I'm conditioned, basically, and we we're saying that they actually are bringing it up again and again in their lives. This conditioning, and that's why they couldn't leave it, let go of it. So, in other words, some uh, some early interpretation was such that this is true. It was taken as this is true. And somehow that there was uh, uh, falling in love with it, not necessarily loving it, but but 
and falling in hate with it too. In other words, that, that somehow that this truth is a part of me and a part of the real world and uh, I have to confront it some way or escape it. And uh, that was the, the personal story of, of uh, conditioning, let's say. And, and because of it's believed as this true event, this did really happen, somehow it's grasped and held on to. Okay, so now we're going to the movies, and there's a story there that supposedly is true. So it's a condition outside of our life, but it's something that we're, we say we're in this ambient, and these things happen. In case, in this case, maybe violence or something like that, and so we're grasping that story and saying that this is a, this is the true outcome of a true story, and so then we need to sit through it and somehow uh, accept it and internalize it because it's true. But actually, it's no more true than our interpretation of our own life. It's an interpretation uh, that some storyteller actually made up, some screenwriter. And maybe he made it up for a total effect to really bomb everybody and really make everyone totally sick. And but he probably wasn't even thinking of that whatsoever. But it's a little uh, too um, abstract for me. I'll tell a story about this, actually. Yeah, please. Because maybe it'd be more experiential where I could relate here. Um, someone once gave me a subscription to Amico magazine which is um, put out by an oil, the oil company, but it's all about Arabic and Muslim culture, and it's a great magazine. And there was an article by a journalist who went to Kazakhstan, and he listened to stories, and he was going to write about this storytelling, which is a great epic tradition there. I mean, fabulous, complicated, interesting. And after listening to hundreds of stories, he said, you know, what? He was so distressed. What's the matter with this culture? Every story has a happy, it does, never has a happy ending. These, something's wrong with these people. You know, what is wrong with them? They never have a happy ending. So he went to a great Jirao, that's the name of the epic singers, and he said to him, you know, look, isn't there a single story here that has a happy ending? And the man said, oh, yes, we have only one. <laughs> <laughs> oh so he got out his tape recorder and his note paper and he said well there was once a man who lost everything he went out on the desert and he said who cares I love your, um, like, the pause as you take something in and then you laugh. It's so nice. <laughs> because, I mean, that's it. You know, it's like he interpreted this as, as unhappy, as, as demented, as uh, it wasn't, definitely was not Hollywood. <laughs> and um, although Hollywood's taken a turn for the dire. But um, I, I love that story. I, I like it because it actually places us right in that situation and then it pops it in a way that's the story of life you know we go out and we lose every <laughs> we lose everything and if we you know and it, when we realize that all that stuff we lost was not us they were just accoutrements yeah. that we put on you know that they, they were there was like a uh, crass ornamentation that we were wearing and it's all lost, it's things. all lost, you know, and then we say, who cares? But I mean, uh, really the realization <laughs> is what I lose is not me because that's what I lose. What can be lost can never be me. What is me can never be lost. And when you realize that, of course, you're untouchable. Yeah, and it can't be a thought. That that's, has to be a penetrating realization. That you, It's the difference between understanding something and knowing something. Otherwise, because we understand over and over again. Um, we would be a lot happier. So how do we actually create the experience so that it's knowledge as opposed to an idea which is coming and going and we believe the idea? So I'm talking, what the storytelling for me, what it's about is, is about direct experience. And I'm not, you know, I have, I have trouble with storytellers who um, they're creating a kind of conceptual world of entertainment and it's, 
I, I love this. What I said before about engagement and reciprocity. I love the magic um, space of the storytelling that is about the unfixed being present and not the, you know, the content or the lesson of the story being important. So my trick is how I engage people in accessing that inherent part of their own um, wisdom or treasure house of insight or who caredness, which is really ultimate compassion, because then you have tremendous compassion for everybody. <laughs> right. That's really the key question is how do you, how, how do you take a stream of information or a stream of words and, and course they have some feeling with them but somehow make that penetrate and be embodied you know you, you call it experiential that's my job <laughs> you know about the jewish story about the um man who was so poor and so ignorant that he wasn't allowed in the temple to pray and uh so he was sitting on the steps and then he just thought that uh, he cut up all the little letters of the alphabet and he just you know, said, I can open my heart and he threw them in the sky and he said, God can make whatever he wants out of it. <laughs> we talked about Buddhism and uh, Buddha spoke a language. It wasn't the uh, Indian language as it wasn't Sanskrit. I can't remember what it was exactly. But he spoke a different language, and then uh, the Buddhist teaching moved to Chinese, China, and was much of the more original writings would be the Chinese, maybe, and uh, the Sanskrit and stuff. I think were later translations. And uh, languages are so different. So then, as far as I know, you tell stories in English, maybe some other languages. I don't know. I just happen well, to know. Well, I guess it's ha ha no. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> but but words are not. But words are more than their content. Of course. There's sound. There's space. There's the image that's generated. There's experience. So there's the emotion in it. There's a feeling in yeah, it. I've there's been a in, judgment yeah, in I've it. Yeah, I've been in a, sometimes. Yeah. There, I was once in a village in the north of India, and my um, translator never appeared. And there were more and more children in this village, like appearing out of nowhere. And they were all like now filling up an enormous courtyard. And time was passing, and it was like 110 degrees. So I just decided to tell stories in English. <laughs> and I did. And I was amazed. I, of course, had a lot of call and response and whatever, but everybody was there. And I thought, what did they hear? But our connection was completely um, real. I, yeah, that's, that's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful experience. Where I'm going with this is basically... It was a hot experience. It was a hot experience. Mm -hmm. It was a very hot experience. So you acted out a lot too, right? Of course. Mm, yes, and then who knows if when we visualize something, if other people don't feel that, if there isn't a whole invisible terrain of language that comes before the word. Right. I totally go for I that. Know. I totally go for that. You know, consciousness is just the soup that we're in. Uh, I <laughs> totally get that. Okay. Well, here's where I wanted to go with the other one. Then I'll just oh, say, you I, didn't I'll get say that. Okay. no, no, okay. I didn't get there at all. <laughs> Actually, I could give a couple examples, but I think I'll just go right to the nut of it. Um, okay. English is made up of mostly nouns. So many nouns compared to other languages. You know, okay, Chinese has hardly any parts of speech. So nouns are objects. And most everything in English is taken as an object. An object means like you're over there and I'm over here. You know, or like uh, philosophy is, is that thing over there. Or wisdom is that thing over there, you know. And these, it has, it's, they're all, it's like uh, putting everything in, uh, in a pigeonhole. And that's not what life is about, and that's not what Buddha talked about either. And the trans English translations of Buddhist teachings are, are deficient. And I think the English translations of actually many of the Indian stage, sages are now even uh, agreed upon as being deficient, but there's just so darn many books out there that nobody's going to go change it. They say, well, that 
that part will just come straight from the sage in the in the fourth dimension or something like that. But anyhow, uh, when we're talking of the Western world, uh, we objectify and just uh, see see things as fixed, and that's not life. If you've investigated yourself, well, first or life, of all, not everybody. And secondly, don't you think that, I mean, whatever language is deficient if it, that you're saying, there is the one speaking. So all language is pointing to the moon, and it's not the moon itself. But then you have a teacher, or you have a storyteller, or you have a friend whose presence and open heart knows how to endow that language so that you can, they can point you toward the moon. So we're talking about the difference between experience and objectifying. And it is all in the person who's telling the story. So if I have English and I don't speak Sanskrit or ancient languages, Still, the nature of awakened mind hasn't changed in those 2,500 years. So with a great teacher, they help you to uh, uncover and experience that, whether it's in English or it's in French or it's in Chinese. Or somebody could use the same language of the Buddha but continue to keep your mind closed because they're not there as the vehicle for um, your experiencing the possibility of space or awakenment. So I think that's more for me what's, what's important um, rather than my story about the language or deficiency of the West because it's here in the West where a lot of um, excellence and a lot of quest is occurring and a lot of things so we're all part of this soup, as you said. But I don't know if that makes any sense to you. But it's all about, you know, there's no way that anybody is the moon for someone else. We can point it, but someone has to be able to experience it. There's something about language that has a living quality in it. I remember interviewing Vi Takshablu Hilbert, who's a sailor, was a Salish, great Salish elder. And we were talking about the Lushutsi language, which is one of the many languages of the Salish nation. And she was talking about how that language in the sound is most of the profound meaning. And, but someone could speak that and that language without that being um, let loose. She had the capacity to speak it, and she was a great elder, and you could hear the hum of silence in the longhouse, where other people used that same language to rouse up opinion and frustration. So that's how I've begun to look at it, because I find it, I find it personally, I'm really prone to having opinions about everything <laughs> in my own culture, and so I'm trying to... Uh, Tell me what Sa uh, Salish I'm, is. What is I'm, the Salish look, nation? In the northwest coast area of the Puget Sound in Seattle. Ah, and yes. Further, there were um, a huge confederation of tribes that had very sophisticated ritual system and education and language. And the Lushootse tribe was one of those many that was a little north of Seattle. I don't know that much about it. But Vi was one of the last great elders of the Lushootse tribe, and she actually took on, her. both parents were medicine people, and she took on, she wouldn't take the cloak of being a medicine woman, which was they were trying to give her and her ancestors, but she said that what she thought the best thing she could do for this generation was to really um, teach the language and the great stories as a way of what she called filling the spirit canoe that would go on into the future. So that connection to wisdom that 
her culture had that pathway. All great religions and cultures are just sort of a pathway toward connecting with that wisdom, that that spirit canoe could exist. So she used the computers and the um, all kind of digital memory and so forth, and she loved all that stuff. But when she taught, she really taught through stories and taught the language and the songs of her people. And she always used to say, oh, my people, our language is the best. And then she'd laugh and say, everybody says that. <laughs> 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 so I loved her for that. She uh, yeah. was a great teacher, friend. Very fantastic. I no, I, I I totally agree with you. And I've actually talked to very very many people that have a certain degree of awakening and are pointing pointing at yeah. the, the truth for other people. I'm just saying that the language maybe should it should be confronted that this is a language of nouns and that and it's so easy to fall into objectification and it should be put on the table you know and I'm not saying that the teacher is not pointing in a way that's from an open consciousness I'm just saying that the receivers are receiving as a whole lot of nouns and because that's what they know and that that should kind of be put on the table and saying well look there are some limitations right. on our language and uh, I'm asking you to, to somehow see beyond those well, I don't know what you mean by putting on the table, because there's another way of, of framing that story, which is if, if, if enough people really empower themselves to be present, then the language, language that's always shifted, will begin to open up itself. Um, so I don't know what you mean by putting on the table. And actually, I don't know enough about nouns. Now I'll have to oh, yeah. think about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what a fabulous time we've had together. I've just really, really, really enjoyed your presence and enjoyed uh, Thank you. what we've Thank said. You so and uh, much. it's very stimulating. And uh, I do hope that we can, we can uh, Thank continue, you. I, I continue don't know our relationship. Okay, Richard, I'd like to know more about you because you have a lot of presence and you've asked a lot of questions uh -huh. that come from something. I can feel this. So next time I question you, I should interview Could you. Could be, you know, but I'm an open book because I've got like uh, 600 hours of uh, a video journal on online so that you can see me for the last three years uh, in every uh, <laughs> every aspect of <laughs> what, what really? my wee brain is doing, right? <laughs> It's not such a wee brain. Very <laughs> active here. <laughs> so, okay. But um, anyway, I, I'm i very grateful for this. And I'm really grateful in my life that I've been able to do something so odd. My father kept saying, you know, I, I left my PhD program after five days to do this little experiment about storytelling. And then uh, it's still going on. He kept waiting for me to get back. <laughs> <laughs> five days. <laughs> But anyway, I still haven't fathomed much, so I, I'm on my detour. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody, Laura Sims, Laura Sims, and uh, we're really having fun. I think uh, you are too. So thanks, Thank everybody, you. for coming. Thank thanks, Laura, for, for being here and uh, gracing us with many, many great Thank stories. You. Okay. Thank you.